was a tough guy. He said, I will kick your ass. Are you kidding? If you want to make your group cohesive, one way to do it is to focus on a common enemy. He got to burn his house down. He bullied his way through things. Do it tonight! They said, boys will be boys. Are you going to cry? You don't rat out your friends. You got to do something about it. It had to happen one way or the other. I think you should shut up. Give it to me! Back out! Shut up! He just snapped. It's very common for children to confuse fantasy with reality. And when kids band together under peer pressure, this confusion can sometimes have deadly consequences. What happens when mob mentality goes to the extreme and when bullying isn't stopped before it's too late? 10 miles west of New York City in Passaic County sits the quiet community Clifton, New Jersey. Clifton was a, a middle-class, blue-collar sort of town. It was an old mill town. It had become a little bit run down. It was a little dowdy. It was largely dominated by white, middle-class, Catholic, Western European people. I think that it was a pretty stable town, not a lot of movement in and out. This was a town built around the Catholic Church in a town like Clifton. The religion really is the secondary core. The family is the first core, and the church is the secondary core for most of the families in the town. There were all sorts of economic challenges in Clifton, so many of the children were in homes somewhat unsupervised because the parents were so busy trying to pay the bills. There's no real bad areas. There weren't any real good areas. It was just your typical American middle-class town. Many small towns have a sense of a folklore or a myth or a story that's associated with parts of the town or the history of the town. In Clifton, that folklore revolves around the mystery of Annie's Road. Annie's Road ran along the Passaic River. It was a windy, hilly little road. There's a local legend that some young girl named Annie was killed somehow on, on this street. One time, it was, she was carrying a lantern on the railroad tracks, and she got hit by the train. And then later, this changes to she was um, went to her homecoming dance and was hit by a car. And the people that live around there enjoy this little legend, and they sort of perpetuate it. Most teens gravitated toward the story of Annie's Road. That's partly because teenage development pulls in the kind of the mysterious. And so myths like the story of Annie's Road take on an important mysterious psychological status. For one group of Clifton boys, in 1992, the myth of Annie was only the beginning of their strange beliefs. This group was led by Frank Castaldo. Frank Castaldo came from a family that was kind of rough around the edges. Frank dropped out of school. He hung out at the house a lot. He had menial jobs. He had access to alcohol and cigarettes. He was a tough guy uh, who talked tough and scared people. Frank's second in command was James Wenger, a boy with a known unstable personality and an eagerness to please. James Wanger was the next oldest. He was 17. His mother was kind of a party girl. His father left or abandoned them when he was very young. His grandparents tried to raise him as best they could. They went to church a lot. James was an altar boy, but he was probably the most mysterious of the characters. And you really wonder, I started to wonder really how much he ever took any of that sort of seriously. Three more boys complete the group. Frank Carboni. He was Frank Castaldo's cousin. He was quiet. He kept to himself. Tommy Strelka. Tommy's the most normal of the bunch. Tommy Strelka and Frank met at like a street fair one time, and he introduced Tommy to Frank Castaldo. And Denny Stooge Studinsky. Stooge was probably aptly named. Um, he, you know, came from this broken family. His mother was a very sweet woman. Her marriage fell apart because Stooge's father basically drank heavily and abused the two of them. Frank Costado's house basically became their kind of hangout. There was a lot of drinking going on. These kids would hang out watching movies. They would come and go as they pleased. You guys! Somehow or another, Frank Castaldo got these kids, especially Wanger, to believe that he was somehow connected with the mob. You have to remember, this is New Jersey. 
Um, this is where they set up the Sopranos because there was some truth to it. New Jersey was for a long time the mob playland. The Godfather was their favorite movie. They watched it many, many times. The boys just took on these roles in this kind of fantasy world that they inhabited. Gustavo just got off on being the leader, the godfather, as he viewed himself. Frank Castaldo, who was sort of big brother, father figure to these kids. James was very eager to show that he was a loyal soldier. He would only speak if Frank told him to speak. If they asked him to ride in the trunk of the car, he would ride in the trunk of the car. You know, he would do whatever it took. One of the younger ones, Frank Carboni, was the pyromaniac. I mean, one of the things he did was carry a can of lighter fluid everywhere he went, so his lighter didn't run out of fluid. He would do things like dip his fingers in alcohol and light them on fire. He also would do whatever was necessary in the group to sort of show how tough he was. Frank Castaldo played up the mob tie just as a way to keep these people following him and doing his bidding. They were playing out this fantasy world. In their minds, they were the mafia. And Frank Castaldo was giving them orders. Every night they got together and drove around and drank. They would drive Annie's Road. There was this story that she had been interred in one of the mausoleums at the cemetery. And these kids used to go up to the cemetery all the time and hang out and drink and smoke cigarettes. And they would visit this one mausoleum, and James would always leave a cigarette for Annie. Frank's Mafia takes on a new member when James Wanger brings in his friend, Robbie Salomini. James and Robbie became very friendly when they both joined this program called the Sea Cadets, sort of like the Boy Scouts, except a pre-naval program. Robbie was a very needy kid and a very high-strung kid. His parents had been divorced, and he wanted to be part of the group. He was very eager to please and just very eager to belong. This was something that at first was maybe charming or engaging to the other kids in this group, but extremely annoying after a while. Robert was a very enthusiastic guy, and he had a high level of energy. And this is likely because he had a high level of anxiety. Frank Castaldo didn't like Robbie Salomini. However, the group kept Robert around because he was their uh, patsy. He was the one that they would pick on, play the practical jokes on. And they cheat him out of money. He was clearly the scapegoat for this group. It must suck to be you. <laughs> he uh, was teased mercilessly. He was bullied. And yet he kept coming back for more. <laughs> they were treating him in a way similar to the way he felt about himself. He felt neglected. He felt empty. He didn't have a lot of self-respect. Clearly, there were problems for Robert. He was using pills, and he was drinking. And so he kept going back to the group to try and connect with them, because it really was the only connection he had. Things continued this way between Robbie and the group until his senior year, when his problems with alcohol became much worse. Robbie had to switch schools in his senior year because he was hospitalized briefly. He nearly died of an overdose, so he went into a substance abuse program. Robbie wanted to save his friends and sober them up and, and rescue them. Have you guys ever thought maybe, you know, we should kind of give it a rest? He got religion when he got himself clean. I think we should all just kind of slow it down with the drinking. And I think you should shut up. Are you my mother? Robert's zeal for cleanliness and doing the right thing became a real point of contention for the group. Do you hear this guy? Robbie told the sea cadets about the drinking that was going on. The boys, of course, looked at this as a major betrayal. The boys are boys, and you don't rat out your friends. You gotta do something about the Good for Christine. nothing. I've been telling Good. You guys. Acts like he's a goody two shoes. Castaldo flipped out and was just furious. Frank Castaldo decides to teach Robbie a lesson. Nobody rats on family. Hey, hey, buddy, do you want an extra us now, do you? Do you? Huh? Get him, Frankie. Do you? Get him. Do you? Do you? Get him, Frankie. Do and uh, I beat him up pretty good. Kids who've been pushed to, to the end point, these are the kids who go postal and take a gun to the schoolyard. When you look at Robbie's life, he's had some major life changes. He struggled with substance abuse. He's being bullied. He actually is the perfect candidate to become a teen killer. Realizing that he can't ask for help and knowing that there's no way out of Frank's mob, Robbie's frustration turns to anger. 
and his choices are quickly beginning to run out. In Clifton, New Jersey, 1992, a gang of boys spend their days drinking and obsessing about the Mafia and the legend of a dead girl named Annie. Robert Salomini is a scapegoat of the group. <laughs> Must suck to be you. <laughs> Always at odds with Frank Castaldo. Tensions rise until Frank has had enough of Robbie. But no matter what, Robbie sees no way to escape this high school mafia and has few choices left. Robert didn't want to have anything to do with him for a while after Castaldo beat him up. This group, they would push him and push him, and then they would welcome him back. It was like a dog with scraps and bones. He got enough from them to not ever leave completely. But even when Robert's out of the group, they focus on him as the one they want to get at. You guys, a guy like this, you don't just get rid of him like that. You keep him around a bit. You know, you have fun with him. The boys actually had a meeting and discussed how they were going to keep Robert in the group because there was still this smoldering resentment over the snitching. They brought him back in to torment him, to set him up, to, to beat him up, to slash his tires, to damage his car. He was just a convenient target for them. And it was kind of like, if you want to make your group cohesive, one way to do it is to focus on a common enemy. Wanger was something of an actor. I think it was very easy to assume almost any role, and so he assumed this role of being Robbie's friend again and trying to bring him back into the group. Robbie comes back to the group and stays, even though he's treated as badly as before. The harassment continues until Robbie does something no one can forgive. One night, Tommy got really blasted, and Robbie had to help him in to his house, and this woke up the parents. Robbie very sincerely was trying to tell them that this was a serious issue and that someone needed to do something before his friend came to harm in some way. But when word of this got back to Castaldo, he was furious about that, and that's when he said, I want Robbie dead. They decided that Salomini had to go, and they actually had meetings in, in different people's houses and discussed how best to do this. They started hatching these plans that were enormously complicated, a wily coyote plots. You know what I mean? You gotta burn his house down. First was that they would use an aerosol can, get it inside the gas tank, and blow up the car. They researched how hot a gas tank gets and how much temperature you need for a can to explode and uh, concluded that this would work. The can that they used was a, a feminine hygiene product. It's not too long before plans and fantasies finally come to life. Down Annie's Road, there was a house that sort of hung out over the road a little bit. And on the third story of this old house, occasionally something would cast a shadow, which to them looked like a woman standing in the window. Well, and they thought that this was an omen, that when that shadow was there, that meant things were good for them and they should proceed with whatever their plan happened to be. They planned that they would all go up to Annie's tomb, which is a fair distance from where they would park the cars, up this big steep hill, and that when they got up there, Wanger would say, oh, gee, I forgot my hat. Salomini, give me the keys so I can get my hat. Well, in one occasion, they realized that the flapper on the car locked. So then they set up another time. This time they did get access to the car and they popped the flap, but it doesn't go very far because what they don't understand is with all the baffles and twists and turns and these things, the can is not gonna go down inside the tank. After the aerosol can plot failed, they decided that what they would do is talk Rob into uh, handcuffing himself to the steering wheel of the car with supposedly trick handcuffs. And then once he had handcuffed himself to the steering wheel, they were just going to insert a rag or something down into the gas tank and set the car on fire. He would be incinerated. There'd be no fingerprints, no nothing to tie them to this crime. Wanger was the one who was the pitch man. You're gonna yes. love him, man. Look at these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. It's real, cool, man. buddy. I, Come on. Try them on. I'm not gonna try you. Try them on. on. I don't wanna try But Robbie just wouldn't take the bait. Every time Robert bounces back, it causes the group to feel as though they weren't quite powerful enough, and they have to ratchet up the power one more measure to exercise their control over Robert. 
These boys were always wondering, why is Robbie so lucky? Did he have some sort of angel looking over? Could it be Annie's ghost? Because it seemed like every time they tried one of these cockamamie schemes, he always got by. And there was at least one occasion where Robbie avoided the trap and they decided they had to run out to Annie's road and see if they saw the spirit as some sort of sign that yes, somebody had been looking after Robbie. Frustrated by their failures, the boys decide to appeal to some supernatural forces of their own. Wanger bought these St. Joseph's medals. He wanted to bind them together. It was a sign that they were entering into this pact together, that their bond was now deeper even than they're just being friends, that they are really about to do something. These boys grew together to form a gang uh, in the sense of kind of a secret club or a secret society. There were religious overtones, there were spiritual overtones, and this was part of the source of their power. We were able to feel like insiders with their own secret rules and connections. Wanger is really beginning to see this as he's setting up his own crew. Frank was getting more and more frustrated because his plans weren't being carried out. Frank Castell, though, really did want Robert Salomini dead. But why get this group of misfits to go off and do this? It's just because he wanted to see if he could get them to do it. Castello certainly enjoyed the, the role of being a capo, what that must be like to send people off to do your bidding. He would also set up the behavior of the boys by implicitly suggesting that he was going to reject them if they didn't follow through. He told them, knowing that they wanted to associate with him and wanted to hang out at his house where they could do anything they wanted, he told them, do it tonight! Well, don't come back here. Seventeen-year-old Robbie Salomini has become the target of a mafia-style gang of boys he thought were his friends. I want Robbie dead. But Robbie miraculously escapes their grasp time after time, completely unaware that they're out to get him. Look at him all day. Just try him all day. Right. Try him all day. Frank Costaldo grows more frustrated until he finally delivers an ultimatum. Get Robbie, or don't, don't come, come back, back here. James really realized that if he was going to impress Frank, if he was going to make it into the Mafia, if he was going to really prove himself, it had to happen one way or the other. James decided that he was going to take matters into his own hands. James had put together a figure eight of an electrical cord with shoelaces, and he tied it together using knots that he had picked up from the sea cadets. What it allowed him to do is sort of put his hands through these two loops like ski straps. The night of February 16, 1992, seemed like any of a thousand other nights for the Castaldo gang. Wanger rounded up the rest of the crew. They meet up with Rob. They go get a hamburger someplace. They drove all over the place. They ended up at the school doing donuts in the mud. They stopped doing the donuts. And James tells them to turn off the radio. Uh, let's, let's listen to the night. He says, I just want to listen to the crickets. And so they're just hanging in this car. Wagger would occasionally make them pray for one reason or another. No one ever really knew why. Wanger said, let's pray. Do the Hail Mary, how about it? Guys, I don't really want to do the Hail Mary. Robert, do the Hail Mary, Robert. At first, Rob is like, well, what do you mean you to say the Hail Mary? And, and, and James finally persuades him. So Rob starts the prayer. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace. And when he gets to the lines, pray, pray for, for us sinners. sinners now and at the hour of our death. James throws this electrical cord over his neck. Hey, hey, This is not a quick, clean murder. This is a teenage boy kicking and struggling and grasping and gasping for his life. And it takes a full 10 minutes for James Wanger to kill Robert Sorlini. Stooge and Tommy, they both take off. James and Frank get out of the car, though, and Frank goes into action to try to set the car on fire. He takes a, a rag soaked with lighter fluid, and he puts it down the gas tank nozzle and lights it on fire. 
Convinced the evidence of their crime is going to go up in flames, the boys flee to the safety of Frank Costaldo's house. They go to Costaldo's to report it's been mission accomplished. Wanger was absolutely gleeful. He was stomping around, slapping his hands, saying, we did it, we did it, like he had accomplished some great feat. Costaldo gave like a little smirk, a little sort of like half smile, and uh, that was about it. But what the boys don't know is that Frank Carboni's lighter fluid soaked rag doesn't ignite the gas tank and Robbie's body's left out in the open. Just by chance, there's a patrolman who is going around the neighborhood and he sees that there is a car parked beside School 15. It's not unusual that kids go up there to neck, smoke weed, whatever. So he goes up to the car, he realizes that this young man is dead. When the detectives came, they, they looked around and they saw the mud, realized there must be at least one more car and it must be covered with mud and they started looking and they eventually got to Tommy. This detective got Tommy alone and basically said, look, I've known you since you were a little kid. I know you're not telling me the truth. What went on here? And he broke down and started telling him. So by maybe three or four hours after the murder, they had everybody. The murder weapon is the type of weapon they use in the movie The Godfather. So these kids are sort of acting out The Godfather, down to having the victim recite the Hail Mary before they kill him. It's textbook. It's a very intimate thing to strangle somebody. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of physical energy. It takes a tremendous amount of commitment and will. And James had no problem at all getting up close and personal in his attempt at wanting to take a life. The greatest challenge for prosecutors is how to try the case without letting any of the five boys escape punishment. They chose to go after James Wanger first at trial because he was the one who had actually done this. And I think clearly you wanted to make sure that you got him. The three younger ones, we made them offers if they cooperated that we would suggest to the judge that they get a lesser sentence than they ordinarily would have gotten. And there wasn't any forensic evidence. There weren't any other witnesses. If we didn't have them, we would have had nothing. Tommy, from the start, I think, genuinely regretted the whole thing. He really went out of his way to try to give us every conceivable thing. Frank the firebug, he gave us as little cooperation as he possibly could. He was actually the, the toughest of the bunch, even though he was only 14. When you listen to their testimony, you realize you weren't dealing with uh, you know, the advanced placement class here with these guys but they were very convincing witnesses when they testified. When they finally did come up for sentencing, the judge refused to go along with it and gave them 20 years each. The trial was quite a sensation. There was very heavy press coverage. Wanger was that same boy that, that we had heard about who was kind of goofy, kind of full of himself. I think he thought that he could charm the jury, charm the judge, and talk his way out of anything. Wanger did testify in his own trial, which was a huge mistake. At one point, he was joking around, and he waved to his grandmother and said she made great linguine. So his demeanor was just tremendously inappropriate for the, the situation that he was in. He couldn't get his story straight. He enjoyed uh, fencing with me. Snowden was an extremely skillful litigator, and it almost seemed as if he was like a cat playing with a mouse at some point. He was daring James to make something else up, and, and, and Wanger would. Wanger would rise to the bait most of the time. Gestaldo had an alibi for the murder. He wasn't there. He genuinely wasn't there. We knew he wasn't there. It's much like the mafia people that he so much admired. You know, a, a mafia boss orders that, that somebody is murdered and somebody else goes out and does it. He doesn't get his own hands dirty. He has somebody else do it. And uh, they eventually came to realize that that's exactly what he did. James Wanger and Frank Costaldo both received life sentences for the murder of Robert Salomini. But questions about their motives still linger. I told the jury in summation, I said, I can't tell you why they did it even now at the end of the case. And neither can they. I think the reason is they all had different reasons. Castaldo was getting off on being the big boss and uh, having this gang that he could control. Wanger was just a misfit who uh, thought that doing this was going to somehow or another propel him into uh, gangsterhood. Tommy, I, I really don't understand what his motivation was at all. He, he's the biggest mystery. And the two younger ones, I think they were just going along for the ride. Maybe in the deepest part of their minds, they never really thought it would happen. But once they realized it really was happening, they, they certainly didn't do anything to stop it. 
I think this is a great example of how teenagers don't really understand the line between reality and fantasy. This is certainly a case where uh, the collective elements were far more destructive than any one element. A group of teenagers who come from unstable homes, obsessed with the mafia and the Godfather, and the more they fantasize about it, the more it becomes real to them. It was really a group dynamic that wanted to do something spectacular and essentially magnified the normal resentments, angers, aggressions into something much more violent and terrible. Had this group of guys never gotten together, Robert Solomini would still be with us. Wanger may not have acted out at this point in his life in such an extreme way. But in this particular group of boys, with this particular leader, and so obvious a scapegoat, it was a perfect storm, if you will, for his killer instincts to emerge and to be enacted. When the jury came back with a guilty verdict, Wanger didn't show any emotion at all. Well, this is consistent with a, the personality of a sociopath who doesn't really have any experience of emotions. There's no guilt, there's no innocence, there's no positive or negative. There's just an experience of being. I just think that, you know, deep down, there's just basically a dead core in James Wanger, that something didn't grow, something didn't thrive, something got snuffed out when he was really young, um, and that he just doesn't really have anything like normal emotions. Competitive sports are meant to be fun. In every game, there are always winners and losers. Coaches and parents are often challenged by how to teach kids to lose with grace. Sometimes emotions boil over, and an innocent game can become a horrible tragedy. Palmdale is a suburb just north of Los Angeles. Its large homes and family-friendly environment draw on parents looking for a safe haven to raise their kids. People move to Palmdale to live the American dream. They want their kids to have the best education. They want to see their children and their families succeed. It was a community where everybody knew everybody. But you could always ask a friend, can you keep an eye on my child while I go run to pick up my daughter from gymnastics and that sort of thing. The Palmdale Pony League is a popular spot for kids and their parents, where they can all enjoy America's favorite pastime. Palmdale Pony League, in the community, it was a place to go to watch baseball, and it was a hangout. It was a place to get together and have a hamburger. Pony baseball is meant to provide structure for the kid. You know, so he doesn't get into drugs or gangs or anything like that. We began going to the ballpark to keep our children out of trouble, to keep them off of the streets. My husband and I were both on the board. I wrote the newsletters for a couple of seasons. Our family was a sports family. It just basically all revolved around the baseball field. A lot of the time we had to work the snack bar as well. Nobody ever thought that anything dreadful would ever happen there. One of the most well-known Pony League players is 15-year-old Jeremy Rourke. Jeremy was a jokester, kind of like the class clown, but he was really smart, book smart and like business smart. Jeremy was really determined in sports. He was always on an all-star team. He was always trying to be the best that he could be in whatever he was doing. And he was good at everything he tried. Jeremy Work was a strong kid, a good baseball player. There was a couple of kids that were afraid of him. He was probably the biggest kid there. He was a smart kid, good looking boy, but he had no discipline. He was obnoxious. He bullied his way through things. I saw him do things that were atrocious. Oh, come on, no! No, the boy, no, come There on. was a group of kids and there was some trouble or a stir up. Jeremy was in the middle of the issue. One day at practice, he got mad and just started throwing balls. He got a hold of a bucket of balls and was throwing them at coaches, throwing them at players. It was ugly. He threw a bat, almost hit the kid on the on-deck circle. Get out of here! The same all-star year I was coaching, he came into the dugout after striking out, threw his helmet, bounced up, hit another kid in the leg, hurt the kid. My son stepped in and said, hey, cut it out, and he said, I will kick your ass. Sometimes Jeremy did have a temper, but I mean, what kid doesn't? He didn't handle strife well or failure well. When things weren't going his way, he just didn't respond well to that. Jeremy was a bully. Jeremy had actually struck 
one of the coaches in the league and had been taken off the All-Star team because of that. Another incident where Jeremy made an out. No! Kidding me! I got that! You know that! And he gave the middle finger to people that tried to correct him. I think Jeremy was out of control. Never actually heard anybody say he was a bully. I did, however, hear <laughs> that he was obnoxious a lot. Jeremy's parents would turn a blind eye when their son had angry outbursts. What? No! What are you looking at? Why? They said, boys will be boys. They didn't want to see this. They just tried to turn their head away. Oh, come on! What is that? Come on! Sportsmanship has to be taught at home. Any type of behavior that's disrespectful towards a coach, in my opinion, is learned from home. Sometimes he would get frustrated. I believe because he was so intelligent, he would probably get frustrated quicker than somebody who, who wasn't. He got kicked off of that team where he was throwing the balls, and then he got kicked off of our all-star team. This is a ball game. This is not war. Becoming aggressive and bullying is not healthy behavior. You're out of here! With Jeremy's bad behavior getting worse, the battle on the field will soon find its way into real life and will have dire consequences for everyone involved. Palmdale Pony League provides a wholesome environment for kids. But for young Jeremy Rourke, it's also a place where he's allowed to showboat and bully. In stark contrast to Jeremy is 13-year-old Gregory Harris, a pitcher for the number one team in Pony League. Gregory was a 13-year-old. He was an athlete and a pitcher for his little league team. Greg Harris was small, but he stood out. He was real fast, had a smile from ear to ear, very good baseball player, very fun to watch. People would go watch his games just to watch him hit the ball and run around the bases and watch the electric smile he'd have on his face. Gregory's family, they were a model family. Very good people. They wanted what was best for their kids. Father appeared to be an ex-athlete. He pushed Gregory to some extent in the athletics, and Gregory was very competitive, and he was very good. Little Greg was always a leader. He was always an all-star. All the other players looked up to Greg. Kids like to win, and he was a contributing factor in, in his team's winning. I do remember him being like MVP a lot and just being like a top athlete at all ages that he went through. Gregory was always well known for being a really good kid, and he got good grades, and he was respectful to adults. But not everyone treats Gregory with respect. Gregory and Jeremy knew each other through the baseball leagues. They played baseball together, although they weren't on the same team. Being in the Pony Leagues, you got to know all the other kids. And Jeremy was very well known in the league because he had a strong personality and could be seen as a bully. Gregory was friends with Jeremy, however, Jeremy would rib him a lot and bully him at times. Let's give him some water. <laughs> Little Gregory is no match for Jeremy, who stands nearly a foot taller and weighs twice as much. Hey, dude, give don't give it to me. Oh, you want the ball, okay, okay. There was never, ever really any incidences to where I was fearful for someone getting seriously injured at the ball field. Gregory was a very competitive uh, little boy and the team was doing very, very well up to that point. They had no losses on their record, and they played a team that was very low in the standings. But that April day in 2005 would not go the way anyone thought it would, especially Gregory. There was a lot of pressure on Gregory this day because this was a team that they were supposed to beat, and everybody in the town was attending the game. There was a lot of commotion in the stands. People were cheering and expecting it to go very smoothly. Kids at that age are putting more pressure on themselves than the parents are. Kids want to win. They know who the better teams are. They know who the team that has the all-stars on it. But on that particular day, the team that Gregory was pitching for had lost. The crowd got angry, and there became a lot of booing. Gregory is very, very upset. I think that all kids, to some extent, put pressure on themselves to do well, especially the fact that the team that they played was the last place team. There was probably a little embarrassment 
by the fact that they had gotten beaten that day. The coach talked to them, calmed them down, said, go on out to the stand and have something to eat. Gregory put together his bat and equipment in a bag, and they walked over to have a snack. Jeremy saw Gregory's team at the hamburger stand. Hey, no cuts. What are you going to do about it, loser? Are you going to cry? Jeremy was a bully, and the unfortunate part is that the other kids knew that, and they were afraid of it. Jeremy was giving them the business. He was talking a little trash. Telling them, I can't believe you lost to the losing team, and just giving him a regular hard time. This is a young man who is 5'1", 87 pounds, versus a person who is 5'10", 190, so it was a big difference in their size. You shouldn't cut. Gregory was pushed by Jeremy. <laughs> Gregory did not like the fact that he had pushed him, and he felt like he was being, quote, unquote, punked. I heard a commotion, but I just saw my brother. And behind him, I see Gregory with a bat. Young Gregory Harris has just lost the big game for his Pony League team. An older bully, Jeremy Rourke, teases him about the embarrassing defeat. When Gregory tries to stand up for himself, Jeremy tosses him to the ground, beginning a match one of them won't walk away from. Gregory just snapped. Gregory pulled out a bat and then walked back to where Jeremy worked. He swung the bat and hit him in the lower leg. Jeremy bent over in pain, and when he bent over, Greg took the bat, swung, and hit him right in the head with the bat. And that caused a vein in his neck to break, and that then caused a lack of blood to the brain. And I see my brother and his eyes roll to the back of his head and fall. A bunch of kids ran up, Mr. Trevino, Mr. Trevino, you gotta come, you gotta come. I assessed Jeremy, and I said, oh no, this is not good, because the swelling had started. So I knew right then, you know, that he was gone. And, uh, wow. There was a lot of tears. There were little girls there, shaking, crying. I kind of like went towards Gregory, asking him what he was thinking. He kind of went into a different state of shock. I don't think he really realized or that was his intent to do that. Police were called immediately and were told by paramedics that the victim was in grave condition. He was worked on by someone who knew CPR until the ambulance got there. From that point, we went to go grab my mom and then to the hospital. He wasn't conscious, he wasn't anything. Like, we didn't even know if he was alive still at that point. I uh, insisted on knowing whether or not he was going to be okay when he woke up. And then they were going to do a test to see if his heart would beat on its own, and it did not. So at that time is when they discontinued working on him. The decisions my parents had to make to stop working on Jeremy has to be the hardest decision to make as a parent. I went and got his brother and sister to come in so that they could say their goodbyes. We were able to take our time with him and saying goodbye and then having family and friends to say goodbye. There was a lot of shock at that moment once we knew that it was done. Gregory was arrested and charges were going to be pressed against him. And it was very important to go to the trial for our family. Um, we were present for everything. We needed to be there to represent our son. I remember specifically something another witness said before he hit my brother, that he said, move, I'm not gonna let this fool punk me. I believe everybody's culpable. I believe that Gregory was culpable because he picked up a bat and he killed somebody. I believe that Jeremy is culpable because he bullied the wrong kid at the wrong time and he had a pattern of bullying other people. With Jeremy's sudden death, people in the community question whether he might have eventually outgrown his bullying face. Bullying is a strong word. It also implies that there's cruel intent. And I think that it was more like teasing him, like, hey, your team lost, better luck next time type thing. You win with dignity, 
and you lose with class. It's hard to teach a boy how to lose. It's easy to teach him how to be a winner, but you gotta step up to the plate and tell your kids the truth. It's a tragic story of a kid who knew how to push people's buttons. You never would have guessed that Jeremy would have been the one to pay the ultimate price. I don't know any stats, but it doesn't seem like the bully is the one that gets killed. It always seems like the bullies are the ones that do the killing. It's a sad story. Kids, unfortunately, bully other kids. And some people react different ways. In fact, the DA, when he cross-examined Gregory, asked him, why didn't you just walk away? And he didn't really have an answer for that. I think you have to have young people that are strong enough to walk away, but I think that's rare. I'm not sure that you could have prevented a crime like this, especially when you look at Gregory. I mean, he had, had no prior violence, had no indications that he was a candidate for an act like this. Let's give him some water. <laughs> I think the most effective way to curtail bullying is for parents to teach children from a very early age. In sports, winning is wonderful, but good sportsmanship is as important as winning. At the time, he was 13, and at 13, you could be charged as a juvenile or an adult. I did not file to try and have him tried as an adult. Gregory was convicted of second-degree murder and received a sentence of 15 years to life in prison. On appeal, Gregory's sentence is reduced to manslaughter, and he receives 12 years in prison. I felt terrible, like we all felt when Jeremy passed away. But I also understood that the perpetrator, Gregory, was not a demon. He was not the devil. I haven't spoke to him or his family ever since the incident. I can only hope that he does something positive with his life. He did apologize. He seemed sincere that he's gonna get his life back together in the right direction. I would not characterize Greg as a malicious killer. I think he snapped. Everybody is capable of snapping. It just depends on how low that threshold was. And that day, Greg's was too low.